what's in your food is even more scary than a haunted house or any of the Halloween mm -hmm. tricks and treats that are out there today. And so I told a patient last week, well, we're going to have this awesome Frankenfoods class so we can teach you, you know, we call it like scary gruel and the things that we call food, commonly known as food, but isn't really food. And um, I said, we're going to scare you guys into eating healthier. And she goes, isn't that what you do every single day? <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, a little bit. But hopefully we're going to really drive it home because the more you know, the more you can overcome tricky labeling and tricky marketing that will have you otherwise believe that some of the stuff is all natural or health foods or some of the common, you know, marketing tactics that they put on the bright, shiny, colorful boxes. So if you go in your folder, we have notes that you can follow along and take... For anybody that's online, after these events, we will make the lecture notes available. So we have this magazine rack here that we've been trying to pop in the notes from previous lectures. And then these will also be archived on our YouTube channel. So we'll put the link. And so you can go back and re-watch this. You can share it with other people. Um, you can, if you weren't able to make a lecture, you'll be able to go and pull them up at your convenience. Okay, so Frankenfoods. This is kind of a sad but true little image. I know they can't see it on the screen, but see, it says this little girl's holding the poster board and it says, I'm not a science experiment. But how true is that? Do you know that most of these foods are not tested for human safety? But they're allowed by our trusted you-know-who to be widely available and sold to you. So we talk about traditional diets. There's so much misconceptions about what's a healthy diet, what's good nutrition wise. And if you just focus on tradition, that kind of makes sense, right? Those are things that have always been true. That's not fad new information. It's not new research. It's just food, the way food was intended to be, the way God put it on this planet, and it doesn't have a label, and it doesn't have preservatives, and all these chemicals, and, and, and that kind of thing. It's just food. So our diets, the diets that our ancestors ate prior to the commercialization of food, they didn't have many of the diseases that we had back then. So you can look at epidemiology as the study of people over time and the relationship of habits and different health conditions. And so you can see a direct link in graphs that will chart when these foods became available on the market and on the shelves of the grocery store, meaning you know they were had preservatives to increase the shelf life of the foods, and then the onset of things like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and even cancer. So we know that there's a direct link. You are what you eat. There's no way that what you put in your body doesn't amount to the health that you exert on the outside. Um, but their diets, if you think of it, they were free from things like the synthetic vitamins. So we always talk about whole food vitamins in our practice. The best way to get your nutrition is always through eating, through eating real food. Um, but a lot of the foods that we're going to talk about are sprayed with synthetic vitamins. So that's not the same thing as taking some vitamins that came from naturally occurring food. They don't have the preservatives in it. Um, our ancestors didn't have um, additives. They didn't put things like artificial coloring or flavors. Um, and they didn't definitely have all the sugar and sweeteners. Do you think it's kind of ridiculous? Like, if you look at some of the packaging, there might be three or four different sweeteners in there. So as people have become addicted to sugar, we've decided as a nation that sugar alone is no longer sweet enough. So now we have to put sugar and corn syrup, and then they'll put a little bit of stevia in it. And then they'll say on the front, we end with stevia, and if you never turn it over to further examine, you would think that it's an allowable food. See how they get you? So they just have to have a tiny little bit of some kind of propaganda, like stevia, and we let, we are fans of stevia in the practice, unless you've tested not well for it in the test kits. It is in our test kits, so some people can't do stevia either. Um, but there's a lot of trickery in all of it. So with the lack of all of those preservatives and chemicals and additives and color in the food, they also did not have cancer. So we just did our cancer talk and we said that one third of all women will have some form of cancer, one out of three, one third, 
and one out of two, half of all men, will have some kind of cancer. So that's epidemic. So can you understand why we need to learn what some of those trigger factors are? They didn't have autism, so you know how much information that there is on autism nowadays and how prevalent that is. Um, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it's, those are staggering statistics as well as far as the numbers. And it's growing year after year. It's one out of less and less children. Um, ADD and ADHD, so those are some of the top things that kids are being medicated for at even a very young age. I think sometimes we think of disease and we think of adults and the elderly, but our children are now coming down with the same diseases that adults have always had at younger and younger ages, and they're getting prescribed the same medications that adults were getting put on. So that's setting them up for an entire life of being a pharmaceutical customer or dependent on drugs and chemicals to keep them well. What? Um, they did not have food sensitivities and food allergies. So can you guys remember a time when you were able to like bake cupcakes for your kids' classroom and they didn't have to have wrappers and labels and you know we didn't have peanut-free classrooms and contact allergies. I mean, that was bad. We didn't have that stuff. I mean. I'm up there <laughs> in age. Uh, come on, say it. I'm up there in age. I know. I'm going to turn 40 in March and I'm trying to get used to it. So maybe if I just keep saying it out loud by the time it happens. So I'm up there in age. So even back then, we did not have these food sensitivities. I know I look 20, right? Is that what somebody yep. said? Yep. Thank you. See? Yeah. <laughs> you always put somebody amazing in the front row. <laughs> Just for my benefit. Celiac? How big is celiac oh, disease? Yeah. So you talk about all your gluten-free. I mean, in my lifetime, that has been a new thing. It probably existed prior, but it's become so much more prevalent that there's gluten-free options in restaurants. I mean, we never used to have that, you guys. Gluten-free pastas and breads and waffles and anything you could possibly think that's gluten-free. <laughs> yeah, gluten-free tortillas. <laughs> You've got it all. So they had to do that in response to people's inability to handle the foods that we're eating. But what we now know about celiac and gluten sensitivity is it's actually related to the glyphosate, glyphosate that's in the foods, the Roundup and the weed killer and the pesticides. So that's actually creating an inability for us to digest foods that we otherwise wouldn't be sensitive to. So it's really not all wheat, it's the combination with wheat and the chemicals that are sprayed on the wheat. Um, uh, diabetes, osteoporosis, autoimmune disease is huge. You know, it used to be a rarity, like lupus wasn't as common. We, you know, there was a couple of things that people knew were autoimmune, but now they're finding that there's a link to autoimmunity with diabetes, with thyroid disease, with gastrointestinal disease. That means that your body, your immune system is so shot from trying to handle all these layers of interferences that it can't fight normal disease anymore and it doesn't recognize your own body as, it thinks your own body is an enemy. So we talk about that even like psychologically sometimes, like we are our own biggest enemy, we get in our own way, we overthink things, but we are our own biggest enemy even physically. Our bodies are actually fighting itself internally on a cellular level. So talk about, I mean, how long has that had to been pr progressing to happen? Leaky gut, that's a new title that never used to exist, right? And now that's even being more widely researched. Um, do you guys know what leaky gut is? Kind of what it sounds like. You know, your digestive system, you should absorb the food and then be able to eliminate the waste material but it actually starts to get holes in the lining of the intestines, and so food material escapes back into the bloodstream, and that's how you develop food sensitivities. So those food proteins get out into the bloodstream and your immune system attacks them, and now every time you eat that food, you have some kind of a reaction to it, so kind of as a snowball effect. And the thing with leaky gut is that it doesn't just affect one thing. With leaky gut, if you don't heal the gut, you'll just develop more and more numerous food sensitivities over time. You'll become sensitive to a lot of things that you eat. So you've got to go in and heal the gut. 
but that's related to all this additional food. Um, PMS and infertility, I put that on here because that in itself is like a multi-million dollar industry, women trying to get pregnant and going through fertility. Um, treatments. It's painful, it's exhausting, it's emotional. I mean, and it may or may not, you know, end in the result that you're hoping for. The reason I bring that up is because there's a direct link with infertility and the toxins that are in our environment. Um, a lot of these toxins act like they're called xenoestrogens, meaning they mimic our natural estrogens in the body. And so then that creates this whole cascade of hormone imbalances and can create an increased link to cancer as well. So there's a lot of estrogen positive cancers. That's why estrogen always gets the bad rap as the, as the enemy. But the other reason why I put PMS in there is because there actually are cultures in the world that don't have any languaging for PMS. It's actually looked at as a positive thing. It's a rite of passage, and that's just a normal sign of fertility, and that's what women do. And then once women go through menopause, they're thought as the, you know, the elders. They're the most wise in their tribes. So they don't have any languaging that links that natural process to disease. Okay, so you guys hear about GMOs. GMO stands for genetically modified organisms. So we're gonna dissect what that is a little bit and how it acts in our body. Um, genetically modified are living organisms whose genetic material has been artificially manipulated in a laboratory through genetic engineering or sometimes referred to as GE. So over 80% of conventional processed foods are genetically modified, 80%. So do you see why we feel like it's so adamant to teach you how to overcome this tricky marketing and to read labels and to be knowledgeable? Because there's been all sorts of, um, they try to bring it up to have licenses or laws passed rather to force them to label it, to be clear and forthright with whether the you know foods contain the GMOs exactly, but there is nothing that's been passed. So it's completely voluntary. And even with that said, go and read some of the Halloween candy. Some of it actually does say, now you have to turn it over and read the, the fine print. It's not in big, bold letters that it's made with genetically modified ingredients. So some of them are volunteering information, which I say kudos to them because nobody's forcing them to do, do that. So 80% of conventional processed foods are genetically modified. So what that means, the reason why they do it is, right? Because if they can genetically modify corn or wheat, things that are major producers and that you know the farmers get a lot of income from, that means that it can withstand the normal you know weather patterns, that it can withstand the cold, it can withstand the wind, it doesn't, like genetically modified wheat doesn't grow as high as normal wheat used to. So if it doesn't stand up as high and there's big winds and rains, it's not gonna fall over and break and you ruin the crop. So these are the things that they're trying to do by genetically modifying it is so that it'll withstand the normal growing conditions and that they'll get a bigger yield, which means more profits. But the problem is that it's not studied for human consumption. And what happens is that we don't always know what the ramifications of any kind of new invention is going to be sometimes for an entire generation. So until we've been exposed to it on an ongoing basis, and it starts to infiltrate our cells, and sometimes even the moms have passed it on to the unborn, you know, the next generation, the children, it's not until then that we realize, oops, <laughs> you know, like we're seeing, autism or we're seeing celiac or we're seeing leaky gut or whatever one of these big things is that never used to exist before. So do you know that they're adding more and more diagnoses, like literally coming up with new diagnoses on a yearly basis. They have something called the physician's desk reference that has all the diagnosis codes. And they literally have to make more as we invent new diseases or create them with all our man-made chemistry. So I had somebody who was a chemist that kind of did some bashing on one of our posts. I don't know if anybody saw that over the weekend. We got a little controversy stirred up, which is totally fine because to me it opens up conversation as long as it isn't negative and nobody's feelings are getting, not feelings are getting hurt, it's not so much about that, but that it's not ill-intended. It's just to give information. People need to know the full truth in order to be able to know what their options are and to make an educated decision. 
So if I don't plead my case to you and give you enough information for you to decide not to eat GMOs, I'm not going to judge you, but at least you have the information. You know what I'm saying? And that's really how I practice on a daily basis. Like, what decision you make in the end doesn't come back on me. You know, I just do my best to make sure that you have access to this other world of information that isn't being blasted all over the TV channels and the radio and mainstream media. Because what we know is that if it's not making people money, it's not mainstream. So that's why you just this information isn't out there the way the pharmaceutical companies have the budget to you know market their products okay um, so the labeling is not required there has been an increased use of pesticides by 15% and so that creates super weeds and super bugs so don't we already know that about our own bodies haven't we already done that with antibiotics the overuse of antibiotics and now we have antibiotic resistant bacteria that won't they don't respond to the normal antibiotics or the weaker stuff like penicillin and so they have to come up with stronger and stronger antibiotics and when they do that the the bugs the na nature wins every time you can't go up against nature nature is always going to be stronger than what we can try to create or invent and so the bugs get stronger and more resistant so that they can grow and now you have stronger bugs that are even harder to kill well the same thing happens on plants it's not just our bodies and our digestive system you can create super bugs in the environment and in the fields and in the crops um, agent orange is often used in some of the stuff this is what you guys have to know he knows what it, do you want to tell us what agent orange is it's a herbicide they use in vietnam a lot of people are yeah. very sick because of it exactly and mm -hmm. we see those patients now that were exposed to agent orange well even though we knew what it what it did in vietnam and there's a generation of people who recognize that as common terminology it's still being used it's still being approved for use here in the united states Mm -hmm. So we talked about that, that the health effects might not be fully understood for generations to come. There haven't been any long-term safety studies. And then here's a whole list of different diseases that have been linked already to genetically modified foods. So the problem is that it look, it's like a foreign substance. We have no idea of knowing how the body's going to react to it, right? And so we are the experiment. That's that little girl up there. You said earlier yeah. that there aren't studies for GMO consumption, um, so we're seeing more and more, obviously. Right. So, where is that heading then? I mean, because you said that yeah, they're not yeah. required to label. Right. It's but actually really scary. Yeah, all this stuff. it's actually really scary. If you guys go and search, like Monsanto is a common word. They own most of the seed in the United States, so. If all of the seed is controlled by one group and it's all genetically modified, that seed doesn't, it won't produce seed to the next generation. So now you're talking about like superpower conglomerates owning all of the food, like our right to, and access to food. Like it's actually really a scary topic. Yeah, so you can go and read more on it, but that's why it's so important to do your own farming and to use organic and to save the seeds and reuse the seeds, right? Okay. Did I scare you yet? Yes. She wanted to be. She wanted to be adequately scared. Is this Franken Foods, you guys? This is Franken Foods, which, and it's owned by Bear. Yeah. So now we have a pharmaceutical company that owns our food industry. This is our, my haunted house this week for Halloween. That's the haunted house. Yeah, that's the haunted house. I mean, I feel like they should be completely separate. There's no way that medication mm -hmm. should be involved with our that's food supply. Yeah. That's kind of weird, freaky. Freaky fact number 42. Oh, <laughs> oh, animals won't eat it. So do you know that animals, like if it's not good for them and you put it down like their intelligence, their, you know, they know that they can sniff it out and avoid it. That's their body's innate intelligence to know it. So we don't have that. But like if your animal won't eat it, you shouldn't eat it either. <laughs> if it's not even good for Fido, then you definitely shouldn't eat it. But it's all, be, it's the same as chemicals. Like it's looked at as a foreign substance in the body and the body doesn't know how to react to it. So we talked a little bit about Monsanto. They're a biotechnology company that's responsible for saccharin, hydrogenation, DDT, agent orange, bovine growth hormone, genetic modification. 
And what they tried to do is they compressed 10,000 years of genetic adaptations into 10 years of mad science. So we talk about like our bodies evolve and get used to certain conditions and we can kind of get over it and grow and build an immunity and everything. But that happens over generations and generations. It's a very slow progression. That's how nature works. Nothing changes overnight. But they're trying to speed up nature and that's why we don't yet know the full ramifications of that technology. We talked about that they own the majority of the seeds for agriculture. Um, there's big groups that march on Monsanto, you can look at that. There's over 2 million protesters, people who believe that we should have the right to know what's in the food, how it's produced, and that there should be clear labeling. That's all we're asking, like do what you want to do, but give people the information to make an accurate and intelligent decision. Um, but it could be the end of renewable agriculture, meaning that those seeds can't produce new seeds. So what does the future hold for our food company? Um, there's cross-contamination, so even the organic farmers who are trying to do the right thing, you know, there's things that are sprayed down um, from the air, there's cross-contamination from wind, so even, the org I'm not saying it's not worthwhile, if you're still gonna get a lot less exposure by eating organic to the chemicals and everything, but it's not to say that it's 100% chemical free, for years and years, they've done research studies on um, they've done research studies on people who only ate organic and used chemical-free body products and chemical-free household cleaners, and they'll still find over 200 known carcinogens in their bloodstream because we are breathing it and yeah. absorbing it, and it's in our earth. You're walking you know? around and breathing yeah. it. Yeah, it's in our world. So if it's inevitable that we're exposed to these toxins, then we all better get on a designed clinical nutrition program to teach our bodies how to detoxify it in the way that each individual body is, is catered to and needing, not just cookie cutter or buy a kit <laughs> and everybody do the same exact thing. Um, the plants can't repollinate. It's affecting bees. If you go and like Google the bee movement, so the, all this pesticide and glyphosate and all of that stuff is even affecting the wildlife. Um, there's all sorts of violations of farmers and consumers' rights that are with are kind of in the mix with this. Um, you'll hear stories. Of <laughs> You'll hear stories of like organic farmers who constantly have people coming to inspect and just finding any little excuse to try to shut them down or find that they're not the pro you know processes are unsafe or whatever they're trying to do. I mean, there are major political and um, you know financial forces at stake here that they don't want organic. They don't want natural doctors. They don't want us to prevent some of this stuff. There's not money in what I do. There's money in all those other major forces. Um, we talked about the bees and pollinators that are dying off. So when the bees and pollinators can't live anymore, like they can't eat off of the pollen and all from the plants, that would affect 75% of all crops. So the pollinators, like that's nature again. You cannot interfere with nature's ability to move pollen from one plant to another to allow it to grow and produce fruit. That's the way it was intended. You can't man-made go along and do it You're on your own. So 75% of all crops. So if you think of that, what are the foods that we tell you to eat? It's all the foods that would be affected by this, right? And if the crops are affected, then aren't the animals affected too? So we're not just talking like only the vegetarians are at stake here to lose their food supply. It's not just vegetarians and vegans, it's anybody. Because if we don't have plants, we don't have the animals. So we don't even have the produce. Um, and then the lack of sustainability and food security worldwide. So can you imagine? Like we're so blessed right now to have access to all the variety and all the <coughs> organic and all the different stores. Think about how many just like grocery stores there are here in Jacksonville. You know, you've got your box stores and your normal chains, and then we've got all our um, Earth Fair and World Market and, I don't know, not World Market, that's Native Sun, Fresh Market, Native Sun Freshfield Whole Farms, Whole Foods. We've got a ton of them right here, Lucky's, tons of them. 
So we take that sometimes for granted that we just have it at our disposal all the time to be accessed. So I always love this lecture, my organic versus conventional. So with these two apples, which one looks better to you? The dark red one. <laughs> How do you know that? Because you're my patient. <laughs> I think that everybody that's here in our live audience, they know that things are trick questions. So what might seem like like the obvious answer, but do you know what the difference of these two things are? The color. The color, the color, and, size. Yeah. The color and the size. But do you know why they're a different color or why they're different sizes? Don't they put something on to make it shinier too? They do cover coats, things in wax. So they're always trying to make like everything bigger should be better, more colorful, right? Shiny and pretty. So this is an organic apple. And this is a conventional genetically modified apple. So they can modify it to look better, to get bigger, taste sweeter. They can make this taste like a cucumber if they want to. <laughs> True, they really super can. They can make it grow without seeds in it, because God forbid you, we have to spit out the seeds or carve around them. Like, that would be a huge old waste of time, right? We ain't got time for that. So the same with the pepper. That's an organic pepper. So it's a conventional pepper. And then my grocery delivery service screwed up and they didn't get me the small garlic. But this is elephant garlic. That wow. sure is natural, isn't it? <laughs> 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 That's a huge elephant. What did they put in it to make it? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's genetically modified. I mean, yeah. it's insane. This is like garlic on roids. Like it's almost the size of my face. <laughs> So do you see how they get you? You think bigger is better? Maybe people would even be like, oh, I'm going to get more for my money, like start thinking about like affordability and all that kind of thing. But they made it grow that way. So organic, think of like, if, does anybody garden here or grow it? I don't know. So when you, if you had an apple tree, is it more likely to look like that or that off of They're the tree? They're not real pretty. They're probably <laughs> even uglier than They're that. Very, right? They're like all tiny and knobby yeah, and the awesome. color's inconsistent. That's an organic, beautiful apple, right? Same thing, like we have a tower garden, so we grow like a hydroponic, and we grew like tons of peppers came off of that thing, but they were cute. I mean, they weren't like mega peppers. They tasted so sweet and they were delicious, but they were real smaller than that even. Like fresh tomatoes And it was all best. organic, yeah. Oh. So you guys have seen this in nature. If you go like berry picking or apple picking, this is not what they look like on a normal tree, right? Took a lot of work to get that apple to be that perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you agree? Do you want this apple? Because it's the organic one. I won't give you the other one. Let me get you on. Now what? You're going to throw it? Don't throw it! Don't throw it! Don't throw it! Don't throw it at me! So I just love that visual demonstration. Now go play in the grocery store and you'll compare the organic to the conventional. You yeah. get a bag of organic for everything yeah. or... I know, they're all cute and little. They put it in a bag too so they kind of hide them. Right? Mm. They, can't be, they can't be out there living with all the other apples because you would never choose them. They're like little ugly things, right? <laughs> sad little apples. Go for the sad little apples. Okay. So organic, what does organic mean? There's a lot of controversy, not controversy, if it's USDA organic and it has that stamp on it, which is on the back, this, this is the official 100% organic. So a lot of times they'll use labeling made with organic ingredients or partially organic. Yeah, it only has to have, again, a small amount of organic to use the word organic but there's no certification or proof or evidence. So like one ingredient out of a whole product could have some organic stuff in it. But what it means to be USDA organic is that the operations must demonstrate that they are protecting the natural resources, that they are conserving biodiversity, so meaning that they aren't just forcing the same crops over and over and over again, that they are using only approved crop, livestock, and processing. So, like, if somebody says that uh, it's organic beef, but the beef, the cattle wasn't given organic feed, 
it's not 100% organic, so the food is only as good as what it ate for food. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a plant and the fertilizer that's used, there's organic, most um, organic fertilizer is just a blend of minerals, that's all it is. Mm-hmm. Um, the use of genetic engineering would be banned, so that would include GMOs, so if you have the USDA organic, that houses the genetically modified that's in the umbrella, so organic would never be GMO. He's staring, she's sharing the stage with me. Cute. I like it. She's cute. She likes the crowd. Um, it means that they do not use ionizing radiation. So sometimes they do, they radiate the food and the meat. Sometimes it's to prevent it from getting bacteria, growing bacteria. Sometimes it's so that the food, they can pick it before it's naturally ripened on the vine, and then it'll preserve it so that they can ship it long distance. And then what that's forcing is the, the um, produce to ripen on the truck, like on the way to its source. So it'll never get the full nutritional value if it wasn't ripened by the sun and by nature. So remember, nature always wins. You cannot mimic how good nature intended it to be with all the man-made synthetic stuff. It's just never gonna match up. Um, The organic also means that it's free from sewage sludge and most synthetic pesticides and fertilizers it's prohibited from organic production. The use of genetically modified organisms is prohibited. We talked about that already. So all of those things, yeah. <laughs> they can use that in the irrigation processing processes. I'm sure you guys have driven past a field and gotten like that smell like <laughs> what is that? So reclaimed water. Uh, yeah. Thank you. It shouldn't be sprayed on our food. <laughs> Thank you. Is anybody scared of that stuff yet? Yeah. <laughs> should be scared before we leave. Okay, so what that means is an organic farmer can't plant genetically modified seeds. An organic cow can't eat genetically modified or alfalfa or corn. And an organic soup producer can't use any any GMO ingredients. So you kind of see like it takes care of everything, how it was made, what the animal was fed, what the ingredients were. So here's some labeling just for you guys to see. It has to have the USDA organic, 100% organic. If it just says organic, then that means that the products contain at least 95 to 99% organic ingredients, and that's by weight. So the remaining ingredients are not available organically, or they have been approved. Um, Made with organic ingredients, you'll often see, and then other, um, it'll say products with less than 70% organic ingredients may only list the organic ingredients on the information panel of the packaging, but the other ingredients aren't listed. So your produce stickers, this is part of our reading labels class and part of the um, grocery store tours. So if you haven't been to one of those, what we recommend is do the reading labels course or watch back one of the ones that's on our YouTube channel and then do the grocery store tour following it because it'll be like put in action, you know, live and you can actually, the patients who have done that, I see them like soar with their progress. Like they just totally take power over their health programs. It's so helpful. Um, And also I think the grocery store tour is helpful because you'll realize how many things are available, widely available, in our normal grocery store chains and how affordable it can be. That's one of the biggest pushbacks that we get from patients is there's this like contention that it's not affordable and we can really teach you how to do it affordably and that you don't have to buy everything from a specialty store. So we just teach you to do what we do because we've been doing it for a long time. And I'm a busy person just like you are, you know, like I can't spend five hours meal prepping every Sunday. So we've got to have some fast and convenient stuff that still sticks to my program and isn't taking me forever to do. It doesn't have to be fancy. So the produce stickers, if it's a five digit code starting with the number nine, it means it's organic. I took all the labels off of these for some reason. Um, If it starts with a four-digit code, it means it's conventional, so anything goes with that. It may or may not be genetically modified, we just don't know. 
And then if it's a five digit code, starting with the number eight, it means it's genetically modified, but that's the label you're least likely to come, you know, come across because that would require them to yes. confess. Yes. Yeah, yes. so most people aren't gonna volunteer that information. Um, to get more information, these are great little resources. The Nourishing Traditions Cookbook, we actually have it, it might be on loan. This is a lending library behind me in case you didn't realize that. So when you're here waiting for your um, appointments, you definitely can borrow the books and leaf through them. You can sign them out with Sharice if you want to borrow them for like a week. Um, we try to put a lot of things with recipes and meal ideas up here because once you guys realize what you can't eat, the natural next question is, well, what can I eat? And we want to give you the solutions, not just the problems. Um, there is a documentary called OMG GMO. Um, the non-gmoproject.org, you guys can look at that. It's really interesting, the work that they're doing. They're responsible for this more like purpley blue and green. So you'll see that non-GMO verified a lot on different snacks. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it's 100% organic, but if it has 100% organic, it also is non-GMO. So the USDA organic label kind of supersedes everything else and then the non-gmo is the next best thing but i will tell you that this non-gmo label is in on a lot of packaged processed foods so those are still snack foods which should still be looked at as just occasional foods not like just because it's organic or non-gmo doesn't mean like it's a free-for-all right so you still have to know the difference between carbs and what contains sugar Organic food can contain sugar, non-GMO labeled food can contain sugar. So there's more to the story, like you've got to know a lot more. Um, the Organic Trade Association, if you want to learn more about organics and how they process the foods and how they're made and grown. Um, March, on, March on Monsanto, that's hard to say too. Um, the March on Monsanto, um, that's the people that are protesting the GMO use of seeds. And then I think Food Babe is a fun one. She, We follow her. There's a lot more. What I tell patients is just go on my Facebook page and stalk all the pages that I've liked and that you know, and that the Health by Design page is liked because then you're always getting like good information and inspiring ideas and recipes you know, on a daily basis. So staying plugged into resources and having access to information will keep you going instead of feeling defeated by this world of people who aren't also on a nutrition response testing program. Yeah, question. Um, uh, Grass-fed beef, should we, is it okay? Are they only eating grass? Or right. GMO grass or? Well, that has to have the label on it too. Right, so it could say that might be a buzzword kind of a thing where they could use it as marketing to make it sound better than it really is. So it grass-fed beef was the question. What about grass-fed beef? So grass-fed, they could have been only fed grass, but it could be GM, you know, we still could have the pesticides and all the other stuff on it. So you have to be careful with that too. So it still has to have the USDA organic stamp to rule out all of these topics that we mentioned tonight. Question? Yeah, is it just me or I found like almost everybody I know has um, suffers from migraine headaches. Okay. And in the past, I mean, like, it just seems like probably in the past maybe five years, I mean, almost everybody I know, all they say, you know, they're on, they have migraines. Yeah. Do it you is think it common. has to do with, I mean, you know, like the autoimmune sure. and like all of the GMOs and all that? I yeah. mean, well, that's really interesting. The question, if you can't hear it on camera, was why is there such an increase in migraines? So let me see if I have that slide behind me. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I use as a common example in our lectures. Um, if migraines was the symptom up top, like you all came for a migraine lecture, that's really just a generic symptom. So headaches, it's just a generic thing. There's over 200 different causes of headaches. So what we know is for anybody who suffers whatever symptom, in this case she asked about migraines, there's some kind of nutritional deficiency. So sometimes it's a mineral magnesium is, for example, a really com um, common deficiency. 
I'm not saying everybody with a migraine go buy magnesium. You need somebody to evaluate you and if that is your specific individual deficiency and that there's also some kind of organ dysfunction. And so we have to get to the underlying root. And so any symptom, the five most common interferences that would prevent the body from getting rid of that and causing the body to be out of balance is what you are tested for with your programs every single visit. That's the immune challenges. So if somebody's constantly fighting some kind of recurrent infection and they're inflamed and having fever, that could be a cause of a headache. Um, if they have are eating foods that they have an allergy or sensitivity to, um, that could cause it. Um, and then toxins, whether they're chemicals in our environment or they're heavy metals, they all have a predisposition to go to fat cells. So our fat cells store toxins to protect us. And so a lot of the fat is actually in our nervous system. So there's a whole ton of neurological disorders that can be linked to toxins. So yeah, anybody with horm with um sorry migraines, they should be evaluated for their specific cause. So you could have ten people in here with migraines with ten different causes, and that therefore the treatment wouldn't be the same cookie cutter symptom numbing med medication. It would be how to feed and nourish the body and get rid of the interference. See, and that's what I feel like. Everybody, they're all doing the same thing, and some yeah. people it works for, but then I just feel like. It's just, yeah. it's crazy, and I just... Right, I agree. And that's really how nutrition response testing came into existence in the first place, was how to individualize information and come up with the root cause for each individual person mm -hmm. and get you on a design clinical nutrition program specific for you. So that's why you could go online and Google migraines in this case, and some people will find a magic cure or order a magic product or do some kind of detox that's kit that they order and they you know it's always the 80 20 rule so 20 percent of people might get a result where the other people 80 percent are like i don't know i tried that it didn't work for me you know same as reading a book or going on the diet so instead of guessing and reading five books and taking five years to find a resolution and driving yourself crazy, you could just do an exam in an hour and do some muscle testing and figure out what specifically is, you know, trapping your body from receiving the healing that we know is capable and get you on the exact right nutritional supplementation and resolve it and get to the underlying root of it. So that's really why we do what we do. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions before we, are, yeah. Are females more susceptible to migraines than males? Um, it, that seems to be the case, yeah. The question was, are women more susceptible to migraines? They are just simply because of the hormones. Yeah, we're delicate flowers, complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Double ruffle. I'll go with that. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I joke around yeah. to say to my fiance. Yeah. Um, I brought a couple of labels in. I don't know if you want to do this after okay. the session or if you have some <laughs> stuff that buy. Well, I let's do it just to see what we see. So at a real quick, quick glance, if I was going to read a label, I would probably... You guys, on the front right away, like I don't see any of the USDA organic or the non-project GMO verified labels, right? So we already, and that's on either one of them. So that's something you could look for really quickly. And then if you go on the back and start, you would want to read the ingredients. I don't know what all of them are. Yeah, so I see MSG right away. Um, I see a lot of things that I can't pronounce. Maltodextrin um, is a corn product, so most 80% of the corn in our country is genetically modified. So if you eat anything with corn, you absolutely have to know that it has like non-GMO on it, stamped on it, or USDA organic. Um, and then um, there are words and numbers in combination. So I always taught that in the labels class. If you see words and numbers in combination, that's something synthetic, chemical, whatever. Um, and then the same thing, like right away I see maltodextrin, hydrolyzed soy protein. Those are all things that are um, other, word, other names for MSG, which is a neurological toxin. Um, and I see sugar, I see corn syrup, um, and a lot of words that are like hard to pronounce. Is corn syrup the same thing as high protein? Process, they're two, yeah, right. It comes from corn. They're both sweeteners. They're just two different forms of the same sweeteners. 
sometimes you'll see both in the same thing, same product. So I didn't mean to like tear you, tear yeah. into your products. But no, no, do you no. see how quick? Like if you know that, you don't have to spend eight hours dissecting every food label. You go boom. Do I see USDA organic or non-project? No, turn yeah. it over and go to the fine print with the ingredients, and which says, is below the nutrition facts. It's, it says no MSG on that one too, and there is MSG. So, it's, it actually says no added MSG. Oh, okay. I don't know what that means. It already <laughs> had MSG <laughs> yeah. in it. Like, Naturally. there was some in it. I don't know what that means. So, yeah. I saw that, too. I was like, hmm. I don't know what that means. It doesn't actually say no MSG, just so you know. No added? No added MSG. So maybe it already had it. <laughs> no, no, what that means. Since last time. I know. Yeah, since the last time they made a label. I don't really know. So d are those seeds GMO, you think? Sunflower yeah, sunflower seeds. Yeah, so she probably got it. You did good because she saw no artificial colors or preservatives. She saw all the check marks that said no artificial colors, no colors from artificial sources, no added MSG. But then when you turned it over, oh, then it says except those naturally occurring glutamates. And when you turn it over, there's plenty of other chemicals. So they're using buzzwords. As consumers get smarter, and they understand that artificial color and MSG and some of these things are toxic to our bodies, they're gonna proudly proclaim on the front with their marketing that there isn't any of it in there. But when you turn it over and read the ingredient list in the fine print, you'll mm -hmm. learn what's really in there. And if you went and searched each of those products, you'd find toxicity. Anybody else want to give me a label challenge? <laughs> I don't have a label, but I have a question. Okay. I see soy lecithin. Soy lecithin? Yeah, what is, what is that? Where does it, I mean? Well, so it is from soy. And again, you just have to know where it's, where it's coming from. So, for example, Standard Process has a soy lecithin that actually is really great at helping with high cholesterol levels and balancing things out. But it is from soy. So if somebody has a soy sensitivity, they might not be able to take that product. But soy lecithin is in a ton of labels. You'll see that as a food additive. Yeah, it's in a lot. And so we can't speak for other companies and products and where they're sourcing it and if it's GMO or non-GMO or whatnot. But soy is one of those um, estrogen mimickers. And it's in so many things that it can accumulate without you realizing it. But right now, soy is in the same market, like the same production as corn. Like right. they use soy and they mo modify and everything. Right. So you have to be very well, I just say it this way because soy used to be promoted as a health food. It still is largely with phytoestrogens and, and that kind of thing. And so they used to promote it all the time for heart health as a heart healthy product. Not all soy is the same. So that's what we're saying. Like soy and edamame, that's organic, that's in the f green form that nature grew it in is different when you eat it in the whole food form versus like how processed do you think it is to get that green thing into a white block of slimy tofu i mean that's processed a ton i was reading in japan when yeah. they allow the soy to basically uh, right. go to the fermentation process yes it's no problem, but right. when you come into the U.S., if you, you know, we don't, and it. we don't want to wait that long, so it yeah. doesn't move in a couple long. of days. True. And, and we just adding chemicals. So right. So have to be very careful. Yeah. So they're trying to speed up what nature would naturally do because nature takes time and does it slow and gradual. So that's totally true. Um, so if you're going to eat it, it should be in the whole food form of it, like edamame, or it should be fermented, like miso or tempeh. And in moderation again, or not at all if you've gotten tested that soy is a you know sensitivity for your body. Or we're from China. Yeah, <laughs> right. If it is where it came from, well, that's like wheat from Italy, right? Like people here are gluten sensitive, and they'll go to Italy and eat pasta for a week, and they're like, "Oh, it's fine. I didn't feel sick at all." But it's not the same amount of wheat that we have here. You know, it's like ancient grains and the real stuff. Yeah. So your body's gonna react completely differently. One more question. One more question. <laughs> Say again, like words and numbers mixed on a label. What, 
Yeah, yeah so that. in the ingredient list, right. if you see words and numbers, it's actually usually artificial coloring. Like you'll see like red dye number 40 or something like that. But there are also other like, I don't know, dimethyl blah 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 5 comma 6. <laughs> <laughs> what? Blah blah. I know. Uh, what? <laughs> okay, so we're going to wrap up the video portion. Thank you again for joining us. If you can't come live, that's always the be next best thing is to find us on Facebook Live or go back to our previous YouTube. We try to save all of the classes so that you can go back and maybe you, um, share them with people who can't come. We realize people have lives and there's nights of the week that you can't come. But for the live audience, you know, we've got, I think the cider should be hot. Um, there's always little snacks and you always get a bonus coupon. So if you bring a guest, we give you health care bucks that you can use in the office for services and for care here. So we do encourage you to come live because it's a little bit more fun and we get to interact and learn from each other as well. So that will conclude Breaking Foods. Yeah.